we're going to make this very interactive and fun. Uh, I want you guys to leave today's session by learning something new that um, that you didn't know. That's my goal for today. Of course, I'm going to tell you about the program, but I also want you to feel like this was the best one hour you spent uh, from your day today. So with that being said, let's get started. Um, <clears throat> So my question to you is, uh, are you looking to develop skills um, and your career in medical product development? Is that why you're here yet? Um, if so, please type yes in the chat. So I know we're all in the right place trying to, to learn about the right things. All right, I'm just getting a couple of yeses. <clears throat> all right good thank you for everybody for participating all right awesome lander great okay perfect so um obviously i like to tell people get your notebook out get a piece of a paper or a notebook uh or an electronic notebook if that's what you want to use uh because you are going to learn something for sure uh in the conversation that we have and then uh some water to to um to keep you hydrated. Um, try to turn off your cell phone. I'm actually doing it as I'm talking to you guys. Um, and then if you can turn off any sort of apps or Facebook, any sort of distractions that are going to take you away for the next hour. I would think about this as a paid session. You you know, you actually you think about you actually paid to come here today. Uh, you are definitely paying with your time. But, you know, if there was a financial component to it, then, you know, I want you to think about it that way. So we're going to learn a few things, like I said. Uh, and then bring one emotion. You're either excited, you're scared. I don't know, whatever it might be. You're you're just uh, curious about what this entails. Bring one emotion to the table because that will make this more fun and enjoyable for all of us. All right. So my next question to you all is, what's the hardest part of developing a career in medical product development? So maybe you don't know, or maybe you do know. So if you don't know, say, I don't know. If you do know what's been a challenge for you, uh, maybe some of you might already be having a full-time job or a part-time job or an internship uh, or might be looking for a job. Um, you know, you might be in different stages. So uh, I want to hear from you. What is the hardest part uh, to develop a career in medical product development? So maybe you can put it in chat. That's probably the best, but you're, you're welcome to speak up as well if that's, the, if that's your preferred approach. Okay, where to begin taking the first steps? Okay, where to begin? Okay, anybody else want to add? Building a network, I love that. Um, okay, I love that, Lander. Anybody else? Okay, so today's session, we're going to definitely talk about where to begin. Um, and, and we're gonna talk a little bit about building the network, but not so much. I'm gonna talk about communication skills, which can definitely help you a lot in building your network. Um, I feel like um, this has been on, on my top of the mind as well of building a network and how important it is to, to anybody's career. So I get it because your network is really your net worth is what they say. Uh, I'm not sure if I can get into all the weeds of building a network today, but. We'll try to, I'll try to incorporate stuff as we go along. And then what are your expectations for today? What are you, you, you know, the obvious one is that you want to know about the program, but I want to hear what are your other expectations of today? What is it that you, you signed up for this, this session? So there must be something that you is bringing you here. So maybe can you tell me um, on chat or, or, or just speak up if that's easier for you? Uh, what what are your expectations with it? Because I want to make sure that we meet your expectations by the end of the hour. Okay, career routes, understanding of the program, yeah, okay. Okay, anything else? 
I know there's others on the call, but I don't. I'd love to hear from you guys as well. So Diksha, Ria, Kavita, don't be don't be shy. Whatever you have to say, whatever is on your mind, tell me. What are your expectations today, Vishal? <clears throat> All right. So we're gonna keep put, keep putting in the chat, but I'm gonna keep keep moving forward. Uh, in the interest of time. So we're definitely going to talk about career routes. I actually have a set of titles of different people getting the types of jobs they end up getting after graduating from this program. Um, and then uh, and then we can, uh, where does it lead me in two years? What an awesome question. Where does it lead me in two years? Lead me in two years. And I want to revisit this as we do this course contents and career prospects, absolutely. So we'll talk about course contents for sure um and then career prospects i you know i <clears throat> we'll, we'll definitely talk about those things so but i do want to ria your question is spot on because I, I love when students ask this question today and not after they enroll in the program like the best time to ask this question is today uh before you've even taken the step to apply uh so that you're making an educated decision so there's three things that we're going to do in the presentation uh, like for today's info session so the first part i'm going to talk about um, the future of medicine and healthcare trends. Then I'm going to talk about uh, communication skills a little bit. And then the third part, I'm going to talk, uh, we're actually going to do a real life lecture on how to create a project timeline for a clinical trial. So you're actually going to learn how to create a timeline. It's from a lecture that we teach as part of the program, but then you get a flavor of what to expect as you know, if you were to enroll in this program. Um, and then towards the end, is when I will talk about the, the course, the contents, the program sequence, all the details, including career opportunities. So um, that's, the, that's the last part, but I promise the first, the first two thirds of the presentation is gonna to be totally worth it. Uh, because I do want you guys to understand where, why this program was designed and what role does it play today it, as things stand. Um, all right, so uh, we're gonna talk about future of medicine and healthcare trends. Specifically, I wanna talk about these three things. I wanna talk about healthcare topics that are trending. I wanna talk about precision and personalized medicine and then job statistics in uh, in this sector. All right, so this, this slide, is, slide is a little bit dated. And then today I was trying to find the updated graph and then I hit a paywall and I couldn't update the, the graph. So, uh, but I think the concept still remains and I think we still hear and see this as, as as just talking to our friends or people that we know or just looking on LinkedIn and so on. So there's a huge buzz about obviously about AI, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, there's a lot of medical products specifically that are, <clears throat> that used to be, that were from the 1950s, 60s, 70s that all now can become smarter products. So for example, I used to work on a medical device for um, uh, measuring brain waves. Uh, the device is, is an EEG device. And, you know, obviously their EEGs have been out there for many years, but there hasn't been any improvements to EEG. Um, so specifically, this company had developed a machine learning algorithm that was that could detect seizures or uh, within five minutes or less. So it was that quick. In five minutes or less, you knew there was a seizure versus the old way of doing it is that it would take four hours by the time a technician came in uh, to to attach all the LEDs on, on the brain to measure the brain waves. So a lot of this is because of AI and because of machine learning uh, that the industry is advancing. So in this graph, basically what it shows is that we're seeing a huge rise in the use of machine learning and artificial intelligence in the medical products sector. So these are just, uh, just as there's 7,700% growth in the last 15 years. Uh, next up is the Internet of Things. So, uh, you know, some of you may own a smartwatch, uh, like an Apple Watch, for example. Um, and now everything can be connected. Uh, your patient, you can monitor your health in real time. So, one of the things I like to do on my smartwatch is I want to know what my VO two max is, which is like, um, you know, how much my how much my body is processing oxygen, you know, and like basically my cardiovascular health. That's the one way to tell what the cardiovascular health is, and Usually it's supposed, not usually, the traditional way of measuring VO2 max is it's very hard to do it. Like you have to go to the doctor's office, they'll put you on a treadmill or a bike, and then they'll try to tell you to ride faster or run faster. 
and then they'll do some ultrasound and then they'll tell you what your VO2 max result is. Today with an Apple watch, and I literally like was checking my data yesterday because I have a doctor's visit tomorrow. And on my watch, I can tell what my VO2 max average is for the last six months year. Uh, so I can actually see my VO2 max literally in like in real time using my Apple watch. So, and we're seeing this across the board. Oh, there's a lot of integrations happening with products. And these are like, Commercial, like consumer products like the Apple Watch, but there's also non-consumer products where the Internet of Things is coming into play in in terms of real-time healthcare monitoring, like the continuous blood glucose monitor. So if you have a friend or a family member that has diabetes, chances are they may be using a continuous blood glucose monitor to measure their blood glucose in real time, and they can see the results on their phone. Uh, so those are the two like trends I would say that are happening in healthcare and the medical specifically in the medical product development sector. Uh, next, what's happening is precision and personalized medicine. So people now want to know exactly <laughs> the type of medical, like the drug or the device that's that's it, that's designed for them and their body. Um, so here's how AI is coming into play. So how does AI use data from variables and healthcare monitoring to make personalized and precise uh, medical uh, you know, recommendations for patients. Um, then we talked about continuous blood glucose monitors. Similarly, there's other diagnostic tools like ultrasound, where AI is actually helping you make much more accurate readings uh, with, with ultrasound. And it can actually do some of the things that the doctors are doing, uh, like measuring things on the ultrasound, so that then the doctor just needs to confirm if the answer is, is right or wrong based on what the AI is telling us. Um, medical imaging analysis, uh, a lot of times, like not a lot of times, a lot of the clinical studies have medical images that are associated with it, like CT, MRI, X-ray, angiograms. And like for cancer patients, you, they want to see what the size of the tumor is and how it changes from one month to the next month. And AI can do some of that analysis for you rather than the doctors trying to do this with their naked eye. So there's a lot of improvements happening because of technology. And then finally, we're amplifying the rate of drug discovery. Drugs are getting discovered faster, and then we're trying to decide which drugs move into clinical trials and which don't based on the use of artificial intelligence. So I want to talk about an example here about the Aura Ring. Um, is anybody here familiar with the Aura Ring? If you are, type yes in the chat. I'd love to know. Sometimes I have people that are familiar and others are not. Okay, perfect. Ria, Ria is familiar. Ria, do you, Diksha, do do you, any of you use the ring or you just know about it? So this device is actually designed to measure your sleep. So that was like the original intent of this medical product. Now the device has actually gotten quite sophisticated and it can actually do other things. So not too long ago, I saw they were doing a clinical trial on women's health to know when they were going to have their monthly cycles. And they and the ring could measure the body temperature of the woman. And then they could it could say, okay, you're going to expect to like have your monthly cycle on this date or at this, you know, whatever the 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 date or the week was. And it could predict those things. Or this is when you're going to ovulate, um, which is like amazing. Like a ring can do that. So you don't have to do other like tests, uh, you know, which is like amazing. So uh, I just thought it was a cool like tech piece of technology. And it just looks like this beautiful ring that you wear on your finger. Minus my wife thinks it's all marketing, but I do see the potential in the technology that's behind this ring. And it's a really cool product. And it is, it has a chip inside it, as you can see right here. Uh, and that's kind of how it's, um, it's been, um, yeah, that, that it has a chip inside it. And that's how it, it works. Um, so again, this is a medical product, I would say it is consumer facing. Uh, and again, it's, it is created by people like you and me and others who work in clinical trials, work in regulatory affairs, work in quality assurance, um, and these other adjacent fields that help bring this product to life. So to any time to bring a product like this to life, obviously there is people that are in engineering that play a role, but then there's also people that do clinical trials. There's people that get work with the FDA to get these products cleared and approved. Um, and that's what this program teaches you. It teaches you all the other things that you have to do. It's not just developing 
the engineering side of things, but it's everything that surrounds it. So there's a lot of things that that you have to work collaborate with other teams um, to create a, a smart device. Because a lot of times the software engineers, the hardware engineers, they they know all the the technical side of things, but then they don't know how to run a clinical trial or how to get FDA clearance and so on. So that's what this program is about. So I'll pause here for a second. Uh, well, maybe I should continue, but let me see if you guys have any questions. I'll pause here for a second. Any questions? Okay, is this all making sense so far? Okay, perfect. All right, next up I wanna talk about money. Uh, I think finances are really important, especially if you invest in a program like this. Um, you know, there, there is substantial like investment of not only money, but also time and energy and resources. Um, and I love the data. This, this data source, I actually pulled it up this morning from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. So this is the U.S. government sharing this data. And a lot of people that graduate from this state program are technically under this umbrella. Natural Sciences Manager is kind of the technical terminology that the uh, U.S. government uses to, to kind of bucket everybody into 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 this. So as you can see, the salaries are around one hundred fifty seven thousand uh, dollars compared to other management occupations. It's one hundred and two thousand dollars and and overall other occupations is forty eight thousand dollars. So there's a significant difference, as you can see. And I, I would imagine like in the Bay Area, you're kind of looking at the top side of this, like closer to one hundred fifty seven. A um, so few things I'll tell you guys. So I have worked with many students in recent months and years. Um, I worked with a student that graduated in May this year, and he got a job with Johnson and Johnson, I believe. Uh, and he was making hundred. I think his offer letter was one hundred and five thousand uh, dollars. But then two weeks, or maybe two months later, or a month later, he sent me an email saying he was promoted to a supervisor. So I don't know what that meant, but I think his you know salary may have gone up by another ten or fifteen percent. Uh, but you can do the math there. So I would say it's between the 102 to 157 if you're entry level or have very little experience. Uh, but it's somewhere in between here uh, is kind of the data that we're seeing right now. Uh, also, the economy is a little soft right now. You know, it's not that there aren't opportunities. There's plenty of opportunities, uh, and, but you have to kind of pursue them. You know, people are not going to come and say, hey, take this job. Uh, but they do exist. And this is this is these are the numbers that are coming from the U.S. government. Um, and then in this slide I, I want to talk about, let me just, oh, this slide is a little dated. I may have forgotten to update it, but you get the idea. So the, the roles for medical and health services managers, the, the, the jump, the percent change is 32% in growth. So 30, there's 32% in growth in jobs or opportunities in the next 10 years. And this is 2020 to 30. Uh, but again, it was, it's still around the same number. Uh, compared to other occupations which are not growing as rapidly as the as as the the medical product development sector. Okay, so I want to maybe pause here for a second and then ask you guys, what about the future? Do you find to be most exciting? So I would love if you guys could put it in the chat. Uh, so I know you guys are still awake and with me, uh, but also yeah, if you want to speak up, you can do that as well. And if you can talk, let me know, and I will maybe check if your settings are proper so that you can speak. So I'm waiting for you guys to tell me what about the future do you find to be most exciting? So some of the things I shared with you, uh, role of AI is very exciting. That's what Kavita says. It, it truly is, um, it truly is. Developments in med tech, absolutely, yeah. There's that just crazy developments in med tech, absolutely. 
good pay and learning. Yeah, I think the pay is really good. Uh, I, you know, but don't do the program just for the pay. Do it like you're actually going to enjoy it. Uh, and you're going to learn and you're going to have an impact. Uh, learning a new skill. Absolutely. AI. All right. AI, a lot of AIs, of course. And then surgical development, surgical product development. Yeah, there is development in all, all across the board, but yeah, surgical products as well um, that are going to be, you know, getting smarter and better. Um, I personally am not very familiar with the surgical side of things, uh, but, you know, the, the, the technology is definitely like not leaving anything on, like not leaving any stone unturned. Uh, even like doctors that are surgeons uh, need AI tools to do their job better. All right. Awesome. Thank you uh, for sharing. So next up, I want to talk about skills that, the, so this is again from the government's website. I, you can look it up if you just search um, Department of Labor, U.S. government, skills needed for national sciences manager, and you'll see these six skills pop up. These are the six skills that the government says um, are, are what you need to know to, to be in this field. Uh, as you can see, I highlighted four of them in green. Uh, communication skills, interpersonal skills, leadership skills, and time management skills. Uh, I think they just added time management. They used to be a different skill before this, but anyways, it's these are the four skills that they think are super critical in in you succeeding in in this role. The other two are more technical skills, like critical thinking skills uh, and problem solving skills, uh, which are more on the technical side. And I think a lot of times we were kind of, at least I was at one point, brainwashed to think that everything is technical. And, and we've talked about AI so far, and as you can imagine a lot of the heavy lifting is done by technology. So what remains is you being able to work as, as part of a team, like a cross-functional team. So can you communicate effectively? Do you have good interpersonal skills? Can you lead a team? Um, and then do you, can you manage your time properly? And can you manage like all the work that needs to be done uh, with all the distractions that we have in, in, our, in our modern life? Um, and, and, and can you still get the job done? So... What I want you to what I wanted to take what I want you to take away from this slide is there's four different skills that you need: communication skills, interpersonal skills, leadership skills, and time management skills. And those are all the soft skills that we call about. So four out of six are like the soft skills, and then the other two are like the hard skills or the technical skills. So I want to talk today about communication skills, and we cover all of these in the program, but I specifically want to talk about communication skills today. Um, because I think that's, that's really, I think that like, no matter like after this web info session, you're like, I don't know if this program is for me or yeah, this is a great program, whatever the case may be, you can still take some of the communication stuff we're going to talk about today and actually apply it to your, to your real life. Um, so this is an awesome book. Uh, and my present, the next few slides are based on this book. Uh, this book is called exactly what to say is by Phil M. Jones. And he created this book for I don't know if, if he created only for salespeople, but it is designed to help salespeople get better at sales uh, and help them with sales conversations, really help them with sales conversations. But to my mind, in, in the way I have used this, you can use all, all the things that he teaches in this book in, in any particular, in any field that you might be working in, including the medical product development sector. So the communicate, so he has 21 or 23 phrases in his book. Today we're going to cover three phrases, and I'm going to show you guys how to use these phrases when you are when you are actually communicating by email or by phone or in person. Uh, the the goal here is, as you can see from the bottom left here, it says the magic words for influence and impact because that's what we're after. We're after influence and impact. That's what we want. Um, yeah, and the book is awesome. Highly recommend you you check it out. You can get it from Amazon or at Barnes and Nobles wherever you want. Uh, but today I'll share with you guys like three three communication skills that you you want to pay attention to. So here are the three, no, sorry, three phrases. One is I'm guessing you haven't gotten around to, you have three options, what makes you say that? So those are the three uh, that we're going to talk about. So the first one is I'm guessing you haven't gotten around to. So how many of you guys have applied for jobs and just did not get a response? Type yes in the chat if you if that's happened to you. Okay, we have three yeses, four, 
yeah so at least 50 percent of you have had this experience right where you apply for a job and you don't hear back i was actually just talking to a current student in the program and it's happened to her as well like she's applying for jobs and she's not hearing back from employers um and what we tend to do is the first reaction when we don't hear from people we either don't reply back to them or don't follow up and if we do follow up then we say hey i am following up with you that's kind of what we tend to do or we'll, we'll say you yeah, know that's the most like usual it's either you don't do anything or you actually send this email saying hey i'm following up on that previous email that i sent and guess what there's still no response you just don't hear back from that person even though you send the follow-up email so the reason is that nobody likes to be followed up on like people don't like what was the last time you're like oh this is so cool somebody followed up on me like you don't you don't go out and say that right nobody wants to be followed up on um so what phil is recommending is instead of using this phrase i'm guessing you haven't gotten around to that's the phrase he wants you to use i'm guessing you haven't gotten around to so somebody sends you an email uh, or sorry you send someone an email you don't hear back you want to give them the benefit of doubt and say you know what maybe this guy got busy or this gal got busy uh maybe something came up maybe there was a hurricane where they live there could be any number of things that could have happened to them right so the a good way to reply to that email that you send them previously is just saying, hey, I'm guessing you haven't gotten around two. And that really opens the, the that, that gives them the benefit, that, that kind of gives them the option of like, okay, this person understands I was busy and I just haven't had a chance to reply to them. And you're more likely to hear back from them. Uh, I've used this numerous times and I almost always get a response instantaneously or within like a few hours. Uh, so highly recommend trying out this phrase. Um, you know, if you if you if you're emailing people or don't hear back, uh, or if you, you call people, leave messages, you know, you could follow up instead of using "I'm following up." Say, "I'm guessing you haven't gotten around to." Okay. The next thing he wants to Phil teaches you is that giving people three options. So a lot of times, people have like no clue what they want. Um, so I think if you give them three options, you're actually trying to help the conversation move forward. And that's part of communication. That's part of negotiation to move the conversation forward. Because at the end of the day, on any project, our goal is to move the project forward. We want to get that project to completion or to like get it to the final state or whatever was planned for that project. Um, and I find this very useful technique uh, to move things forward. Like even simple things between colleagues, like you're trying to figure out whether you should do this or that. And then you're like, we're really confused. We have no idea. Uh, and then you try to have a meeting um, or you're trying to negotiate with a supplier and then you don't want them to like pigeonhole you in a larger amount, like a larger uh, fee or something that like a term that's unfavorable to your organization. So the best thing is like to giving them three options. So what Phil says is give them three options. The first option is a terrible option. Uh, second option is a not so great option. The third option is your preferred choice. Um, so let me give you an example. So if I'm negotiating a contract with a, with a clinical trial site or a supplier, I'll say, you know, the first option is, uh, you know, we don't do business with you. Okay, that's our first option, which is a terrible option for both parties. Like we do want to do business with each other, but that's a option that you could technically take and don't work with each other. The second option is, okay, um, you guys give us a 50% discount on your services because your services are too expensive uh, or maybe like seven twenty five percent discount uh, maybe that's the second option it's not such a great option right the third option is we'll pay you what you're asking for only if you deliver the results that we are are outlining in the contract so if you enroll patients by this date then we'll pay you the full hundred percent if you do not enroll all the hundred patients that you said you would enroll in the study, then we'll only pay you 75% of this amount. So, and that's the preferred choice because that allows them to like work hard to get, get the money that they want. But this just doesn't work with finances. It can work with a lot of different things. So giving people three options is a great way. And in this order is what Phil recommends. And then finally, um, have you had anybody tell you, you apply for a job and then they say you don't have the skills needed for their role. That's the third bullet right here. Have you have you have, have people told you that? 
They're like, you, I don't think you're qualified. Has anybody heard that? Okay, probably not. Okay. Uh, but this happens quite a bit. Uh, um, you know, a new treatment is not working for our patients. The doctor may say that. And the doctor may say that against what the data reveals from a clinical study, right? Um, and, and the doctor says it's not working. Like, what do you mean by it's not working? Like, you've got to explain what that means. Uh, or the budget is too high. But what does too high really mean, right? Or you don't have the skills needed for this job. Or this is not a quality product, right? Uh, <clears throat> so rather than challenging that person and saying, why do you, do you say that? Like, using the term why is probably the most dangerous thing that you could do. Because now that other person is going to get very defensible very quickly. Because they're going to be like, no way. Like, how dare you ask me why? And if there is a power dynamic, if that person is a senior to you, chances are they're going to not be happy when, when you ask the why question, right? Um, so instead of doing that, you say, what makes you say that? And so if you ask them this question, what makes you say that? It makes them start thinking. And then they give you some more details, okay? And that's how you will understand. So maybe they'll say, you know what? You, you haven't ever created a, a budget. And I don't, you know, in our, in our, in this job as a contracts analyst, you'll be creating a lot of budgets. And that gives you an opportunity to say, you know what, I did this program, I did this class. And one of the things that we did in class is we actually created a real budget for a clinical study. So I have created a budget as part of a project that I worked on. Um, and that gives you an opportunity to understand the needs of the other person. And then it helps you address some of the concerns that they may have. So it actually helps create a conversation rather than making the pe people involved be more defensible or frustrated with each other. So with that being said, those are the three phrases uh, we talked about. I'm guessing you haven't gotten around to, you have three options, and then what makes you say that? So now it's your turn. You guys need to tell me what was most useful for you from from this discussion that we had with on communication skills. So if you want to put it in the chat, do that. Or if you want to speak up, please speak up. You have three options, yeah. Not using why is it definitely a sensible thing to do. Yeah, understanding how to communicate with leaders. Absolutely, Anna. Understanding how to communicate with leaders is so critical and, and kind of figuring that out is a, is, is a process in itself. Understanding three options, absolutely. I think that seems like a popular op. Uh, yeah, giving people three options, that's right. Yeah, so cool. I hope you guys can apply some of these uh, and highly recommend checking out Phil's book. Uh, I think he'll be happy if you bought his book, but you don't have to, uh, but it will help you guys um, learn and apply this in your real world. Okay. So next up, we're actually going to do a real project. I'm going to teach you guys how to create a project timeline. Okay. Uh, it doesn't matter if you do clinical trials or not, but creating a timeline is one of the key things that we teach in our project management class. And it is an important skill that you need to all learn. Um, the, the way you create project timelines, well, the, the issue with creating project timelines is as follows. There's five issues. The software is sometimes very difficult to use. It's very clunky. Um, like we're talking about mess project, like used to be a software a lot of people used to use uh, to create timelines. It's very difficult to use. Uh, or an Excel spreadsheet might be tricky. It might be not be presentable. Like Excel spreadsheets don't look very pretty if you're creating a timeline on an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, lack of detail, like the timeline might be too high level and may not include all the details you need. Uh, it might be difficult to update. So a lot of times that we, the projects that we work in medical product development sector, the timelines are, it's not like constructing a bridge. I mean, maybe constructing a bridge may have similar channel, constructing a parking lot. Uh, it's more predictable uh, in terms of timelines. Clinical trials can be a, a little bit unpredictable because you kind of are depending on on like where patients are gonna be enrolled at different hospitals around the country. And then you don't really know how, how many patients will be enrolled really once you get the study up and running. So there's a lot of moving parts. Um, and then it's difficult to uh, understand timelines. 
like, yeah, you create a timeline, but then you can't follow. Um, so the solution is creating easy to use timelines that are beautiful, complete, quick and easy to update. I think that's really a differentiating factor, timelines that are quick and easy to update, and then uh, easy to follow. So that's what we're going to do today, okay? So I am going to, uh, let me see, I'm gonna, we're going to do this real world session, okay? So bear with me as I pull this up. Okay. So you guys can see my screen. You can see my Excel spreadsheet. So I did a dummy timeline. I put together all the different deliverables for a clinical project. So you create a protocol, which is like a process of how you're going to conduct your study. You finalize your, your budget, like how much are you going to spend or you know pay for the, doing the trial. You complete an ethics review packet uh, for the ethics review board. You submit the packet, you get their approval. That's what IRB stands for, Institutional Review Board. Uh, you schedule the training uh, with the hospital where the study is happening. Then you conduct the training. You enroll the first patient, which is kind of a big milestone in any clinical trial. Then you recruit all the patients, and then you analyze the data, and then you publish a report. So these are all the exact steps, okay? So um, let's just say for this project, we have... Desiree is going to be doing developing the protocol. We have Kavita doing the budget. And for the IRB, we're going to have Lander do the IRB stuff. He's going to be responsible for that. And then the training, we're going to have uh, Diksha do the training. Okay. And then she's going to also conduct the training. And then first, first patient in, we're going to put Vishal in charge of that. Or maybe this is the site that's doing it. And then this is the site. And then maybe Vishal, you're doing the data analysis. And if I left you, I'm sorry. And then we can get Ria to do the publication of the report. Um, so these are all the, the names that I put. It's just, I made them up. You guys are on the call. Uh, if I missed you again, I'm sorry. But the, the idea is like, who's responsible for doing things, right? And then how long it's going to, take to do these things, right? So to write a protocol, maybe it's going to take you 40 working days, like about maybe less, 20 working days. I don't know. Let's just use 20. Uh, finalizing the budget is going to take five days. Creating a submission packet is going to take 10 days. Submitting is to the IRB is going to take one day. Obtaining approval is going to take another 10 days. It's going to take five days to schedule the training. It's going to take two days to conduct the training. And then you're going to enroll your first patient in. Uh, okay, um, and then you're going to recruit patients, and that's going to take about, uh, you know, 80 days, let's just say 90 days, uh, sorry, 100 days. That's almost five months, uh, because these are working days. Uh, and then data analysis is going to take another month and a half, and then publishing the report is going to take a month and a half. So we put all this in here, okay? So this is the easy, this is the relatively easy part. Then you put the start date. So today's date is October 17, 2024. So what do you do is, so this is where you need to pay attention, okay? So please watch here carefully. There's only one formula you need to know in Excel to do this. It's called equal to work day, open parentheses, start day, comma, number of days. So you start on the 17th of October, you'll be done by 14th of November. This formula accommodates for uh, holidays and weekends. Then you, you begin your next task on the 14th, and then you keep going down this path. Okay, so let's just say, I'm just gonna pull this down, and then I'm gonna pull this down. And voila, your report is gonna be published on the 5th, 13th of August, 2025. And that's how you quickly get your Excel timeline in place. Do you guys see that? So there's only one formula you need to know. Workday, open parentheses, a start day, comma, working days, and then you just pull the pull down on the on the you don't even have to enter the formula again. It just drags itself. And it'll give you exact dates on when things will be done. Yeah. So next up, what we're gonna do is we're gonna pull this this uh this data into a software called office timeline so i'm going to show it to you guys right now um uh, let's just say office timeline.com um 
So you get an Excel spreadsheet with your timelines and it's good. I think it, it, it kind of does its job, but you need something more pretty to send it to your senior leadership. Um, and to do that, and hopefully I can log in, uh, let's see. So I logged in, uh, I use a Mac, so I'm gonna just work in my browser. And then I'm gonna create on make timelines now. Probably we don't need to use a, okay. All right, um, I'm gonna do new timeline and I'm gonna click on import data, import from Excel. I'm gonna hit browse and then where is recent? So this is the timeline example. And then this is it. So we, we have, this is what we were doing right now. You guys remember, right? So we, I pulled every, all the data in, right? You, you guys see your names here? Well, maybe maybe it was, it didn't pull the right file. Uh, let me see. I don't know why I didn't browse another file. Hold on guys, maybe I didn't hit save and that's kind of what may have happened. Give me one second. Let me see, give me one second. I'm gonna make sure I save this file. File, save as. Yeah, it's saved. Uh, I'm gonna to put today's date so I can identify this. Okay, let's see, I hope it works this time. Um, browse another file. I think this is it. No, it's not letting me select it. Uh, let's see. Oh, there you go. All right. So we have this file. I'm going to hit open. All right. Now we have it. So we have all the, your, because that's how I know on the right file. So I have your names here. We, we pulled in all the data. We have this date, com this project completing in 2025. Um, Okay, and then it kind of has the headers automatically, the titles of the tasks and so on. So then I hit next. All right, so here are all the different deliverables, right? Um, so it's asking me to upgrade. So I just, I'm just gonna do the first few, not ever, let's just do these, these tasks right here, right? And then just selected these tasks, I hit import, was I, I don't have a paid license on this computer, so it's not letting me do it. Uh, so I didn't couldn't select all the tasks, but I could select a lot of them. Um, and this say that submitting to the IRB is going to be a milestone that we're going to be excited about. So we're going to mark that red. And then first patient in is obviously going to be a big deal for organization because we just launched a new trial. And that's good. Okay. And then you click on the timeline. And here I'm going to say my clinical trial timeline. Oh, maybe this is a clinical trial timeline. And then there's a download button right here. You can do a JPEG download or PowerPoint download. So I just hit a download. And let's see where this file got downloaded. And voila, do you guys see it? So this is a really pretty timeline that you can put in front of a VP and they'll think you've put in hours trying to create this. And that's your timeline. Uh, so if you wanted to work with a project team, you'll give them a detailed timeline with the Excel spreadsheet, uh, but they can also use this timeline. Uh, like it says, we're today, August, oh, sorry, October 17. And then it 
what puts the flags on the different milestones in this beautiful timeline that tells you when you're going to end the project. Yeah, isn't that cool? All right, so I'm going to go back to the slides. Let's see. So this is so all right. So that's that's on the timelines. Let me see. Do you guys have any questions or comments on the timelines? Was this what was most interesting about this presentation? Did you guys feel like you learned something? Want to hear your thoughts? You, you can put anything you want in the chat. All right, cool. Data, very useful. All right, good. Um, Workday Excel equation. Yeah, isn't that like an amazing little hack? Uh, it's like one. Well, you just need to know one thing, right? <laughs> uh, and and you you're done. Like, I mean, it doesn't happen that often that you can create a timeline in like five or seven minutes. Um, and realistic preview. Yeah, absolutely. Good. Thank you for sharing that feedback. Um. Okay, so then I want to let's talk about the course because uh, that's the next thing I want to talk about. And then I want information about how I can create my clinical timeline. Okay, perfect. All right, you can do it totally. Um, so I want to talk about the program next up. Uh, so the Masters of Science in Medical Product Development Management, that's what this program is. It's 13 courses, 35 units. It's a two year graduate program. Is designed for working professionals. So a majority of our classes are on at 6 p.m. on weekday evening. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Uh, we don't have classes on Friday. Um, and then some, this one or two classes that happen on the weekends, uh, but it's not, it's usually like only year one. We have a professor that he teaches some classes in person on Saturdays. Um, but that that's kind of it at the moment. Uh, but a lot of the classes are in the week, 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 weekday evenings. Um, we have hybrid classes. So we may have some lectures that are online, some lectures that might be in person. Uh, we accept only new students in the fall semester. Uh, the tuition is up there. I, I know that San Jose State recently like, revised their tuition plan. So it does increase a little bit every year. Um, so the, if you enroll in fall 2025, I believe this is the amount uh, that you have to pay in total. Uh, but just it's, it's, it's very close to that amount, if not that amount, but that's what I checked today. Uh, and that's the amount I came up with. Uh, okay. So in terms of the courses, so somebody was asking me what the, what the workflow or sorry, the sequence of courses and the work courses are. So I'm going to walk you guys through each of them. So you understand what, are, what, what are you going to actually learn in each of those classes? Okay. So the first one is SMPD 281A. It's a three unit class. Uh, this class specifically focuses on clinical trial design. Okay, so how do you put together a clinical trial like protocol and what are the different components of the clinical trial protocol? So that's what this class is, SMPD 281A. SMPD 281A2B, so SMPD 281B, it, sorry, let's finish fall and then we'll come here. So developing and managing people, that's taught by the College of Business. Uh, and this is taught by Professor Mike Hill. Uh, as the title says, it's about how do you develop and manage people. Uh, Regulatory Affairs 1 for biopharmaceutical. This is taught by the um, by Professor Sheldon Mullins. And he he is he does, covers all the drugs, uh, regulatory affairs from a drugs perspective with the FDA. Then in the spring, there's Clinical Development 2 Seminar, SMPD 281B. Uh, this is on clinical trial operations. So this class is on clinical trial design. This class is on clinical trial operations, okay? Um, I should tell you that this class might be changing from two units to three units in fall and spring 2026, uh, because I think we have a lot of content that we try to cover in this class. And right now it's designed to be two units, but it may be three units by the time you guys apply. Um, law and ethics is a two unit, uh, sorry, this is a three unit class that's two units, it's a typo. Um, and this is taught by, again, the College of Business, uh, Professor Ash Podwell, he's amazing. Uh, and he teaches uh, this class. Regulatory Affairs 2 is a medic for medical devices and diagnostics. This is a class I teach. Uh, it's a hybrid class. Uh, and we, we learn everything about the US medical device uh, sector 
as it relates to uh, FDA clearance and approvals. Then in the spring and the summer, there's a research practicum uh, that's taught by David Rutledge. He has about 20 years of experience in the industry and the, probably the same number of years that he's worked at in academia. Um, and David, uh, we're, we're, he last year was his first year teaching the class. It's going to be a second year, so we're still trying to refine this class to make it better. Uh, but this is the class that he teaches in the spring. Then in the fall of the following year, the year two, there's a clinical trials management class, 2889A. This is taught by a student, an alum who was in this program. Her name is Vivan Tran. She's amazing. And she talks about pharmacovigilance and, and uh, safety and so on in this particular class. Um, then we have biomedical business 202T. Uh, this class focuses on um, the whole life cycle of a medical product from start to finish. So it's not just the not just clinical trials or regulatory affairs or quality, but marketing, sales, reimbursement. It's like the whole life cycle. Then we have a statistical methods for clinical trials taught by Professor um, Anand. Um, so she teaches the stats class. Um, and then in the spring semester, there is a 289B. This is your capstone project for three units. And then we have another, oh, I mixed these two up. I, I think I meant to, I don't know how I got it. So this was the one I was telling you guys about the whole life cycle of a medical product from like sales, marketing, commercial, everything. Uh, the biomedical business is like a project management class where we learn about different project management aspects uh, of the biomedical business. And then last up, we have the uh, bioinformatics class taught by the computer science department at San Jose State uh, in drug and device development. So that's the course overview at a glance. I'll pause here for a second to see if you guys had any questions on this slide or this slide for me. Um, who is it for? Somebody asked me, like, what are the, what what kind of jobs you can get? So uh, I highlighted all in green. You can see the different types of uh, roles that people have. I think there's some that are probably missing. I probably should add more to this. Um, so these are the different titles of people. Uh, these are real titles of people that graduate from the program. And these are the titles that they have, uh, or these are the options that they have. So a director of clinical affairs, and these are all the different clinical roles, a consultant role, a quality assurance, quality control, regulatory affairs, medical affairs, um, scientists. I don't know how many people actually take a pharmacist role. I find that pharmacists might be want to take this program so that they can get into the industry, uh, but I don't see the other way around. But we again, there this you know, you could technically be a pharmacist and be part of this program. Uh, you can be a technician, a salesperson, engineer, project manager, and project coordinator. So these are all the different types of jobs that you can get after you graduate from this program. Program requirements, uh, a bachelor's degree is required from an accredited university. So four years of college or university. Uh, we do need copies of your transcripts, including any graduate transcripts you might have. The minimum GPA requirement is 2.5, but we do ask that you be closer to three uh, to increase your chances of being accepted into the program. Uh, two letters of recommendation. I always get asked this question, like, it, you know, get it from a class professor, a supervisor, uh, like it shouldn't be from a friend, but somebody who's actually worked with you on a project. That's what we're looking for. Somebody who's worked with you on a project and they can tell how you worked with them on that project. Um, copy of your CV, a resume, and then statement of purpose. Uh, I put the statement of purpose requirements on this um, slide. Uh, you guys can take a screenshot if you want, or I can send the slides after this, uh, this session. Uh, but basically, here are the questions that are just going to prompt you to uh, you know, think about it. The, the question that I changed today was number four. Where do you see yourself in 10 years from now? I, I see like a lot of people asking about a five-year question, and I recently heard like it's probably better to think about things in a one hour, like what am I going to do in the next hour? And what am I going to do in 10 years? Where do you want to be in 10 years? And I think that's that's the question you want to answer when you fill out the statement of purpose. Here's, here are the different resources for you. So to apply, you have to apply through calstate.edu, apply. It's a, it's a two-step process, but you do have to apply through the Cal State website first, and then you'll get notified by SGSU if you've been accepted into the program and so on. 
So Cal State applies like the central portal where everything gets applied. Uh, there is, I think, a small fee to apply. Uh, I don't know what it is. I know last year was seventy dollars. I don't know what how much it is this year. I think it's still the same, most likely. Um, if you want to learn about the program, you can go to this website. And then, if you want to schedule time with me, this is the calendar link for you to send schedule time with me for a one on one situation to discussion that's related to your situation. Uh, or you can email me uh, your questions as well. Let me see. There might be three plus one education accepted. I don't know what that means. Vishal, can you please clarify? Three plus one. Yes. Uh, I actually do not know the answer to that question. If you've had a, is a, is a one, is that a master's, the one year? I believe you should be okay, but I would recommend we check on that for you. Uh, do you want me to, do, do you have a, uh, do you have a way to contact the admissions office about that? Um, I'm just going to type up the email. Her name is Christina, Christina dot, so you, you could save her email, send her an email, uh, and she can confirm. I, I'd rather have her confirm than, um, okay, sorry, I put it, in, I'm putting it in the chat, but it's not going to all of you guys. So I'm going to send it, it accidentally went. Okay, so tell me if you guys got my message. Um, I put it in the chat right now. And then the next question was, let's see, uh, yeah. Uh, the tuition is in total uh, what I shared. So that is the case. Um, it's going to be closer to the 36,000. This is the total for both years, it's not per year. It's for both years, yeah. Uh, so Desiree, it's a good question. You know, um, although like for the first year we have some classes that are happening in person, I, I think the we I feel like the students miss if we don't do one or two lectures in a class that are in person. Okay. So we we try to do like a, if there's a 10 week class, then we will have two lectures in person and the rest on Zoom. Um and then starting this year, we're also doing a guest lecture series on Fridays, which is in person only. So the, I think the idea is to increase the in-person interactions with being like like getting people to see each other, uh, not necessarily for class, but also just outside class. Um, so there's no online version at the moment for the program as a whole. To answer your question in short, it is a hybrid program, um, but a lot of it is also online. So there might be sometimes you might have to drive up if you are a little bit further out from here, uh, but a lot of times you can do this on uh, over Zoom. Uh, Vishal, great question. It's not understand this particular program. We have had discussions about what, applying for STEM, but at the moment, this program is not a STEM program. Uh, but it does fall under the College of Science, um, but it's not a STEM program. Okay, good questions. All right. Um, so yeah, again, here's, if you want to take a screenshot, I can send the wet slides again, actually, to, I mean, I can send the slides to you guys. Um, happy to chat further. Um, I don't want to respect people's time. Uh, I like to do these over 90 minutes, but I found that it, they can be done in 60, so I don't try to extend this, extend this anymore. Uh, but happy to stick around, feel free to speak up, ask your questions, type them in the chat. Uh, and if you don't have any questions, then um, I think we're done for the night. And um, yeah, if you decide to apply, let me know. You can send me an email uh, so I know that you've applied. Uh, you know, I'm always like excited if people come to an info session and they apply. It's always kind of good to know. Okay. Um, anything else? I'm going to put my name in the chat. Uh, SJS, you know, you. Uh, the deadline is May. I think it's either April 1st, 2024. And this 2025, April 1st, 2025. Yeah, go with that deadline. Um, I think we either it's May 1st or April 1st, but there's different deadlines for international and domestic students. Um, but yeah, you're welcome, Anna. I'm glad you had a you you enjoyed the session. Ria, you're welcome. Uh Michelle, you're welcome. Um, I hope I answered the question. Good. I'm glad, glad to hear it was very useful. Thank you so much for for being with me and spending your evening 
Um, thank you and have an awesome night. Sounds good, Desiree. Or you can talk to me now. Yeah. All right, Vishal, you good? Do you need anything else? Okay, all right.